So what is behavioral economics? Behavioral economics is basically taking microeconomic theory and relaxing one assumption. And that assumption is the assumption of rationality. Everybody knows that people aren't rational, in which case that's potentially a weakness in economic modeling, in which case there's the potential to improve economic modeling by building some of the predictably irrational things into our models. Now, what are the models doing in the first place? A lot of people complain about models. Um, they want real world situations, not these theoretical models. And of course, data is real world. So there's this movement to just look at data and to leave behind the theory. However, we need models. Models do a few things for us. I mean, the most classic thing they do for us is that they help us predict future activity or future events. But that's not the only thing that models do. Models can help frame our understanding of data. So when we see a piece of data or a correlation, how does that fit in with the bigger picture of what's going on? A model can sort of build a framework for the bigger picture so that different pieces of data that you find in different studies, different parts of the world, you can sort of stick those uh, data correlations into your model to get a broader frame of what might be going on, and that frame is still informed by the data. Models also allow us to simulate things that are counterfactuals. Um, if we're going to do policy, of course, we're, we need to think through what would happen if we implemented policy A versus policy B, and how can you think about those? You have to run a counterfactual, a situation that does not exist in the real world if you want to predict what would happen under the two policy regimes. And the other great thing about models is that they speak well with data. Okay, so let's think about if behavioral economics is relaxing the assumption of rationality, what exactly is it relaxing? What is the assumption of rationality? And I like to use the definition of rationality that is pursuing enlightened self-interest. Because each component there can be is something that we can dig into and relax. So the first one is pursuing. Are people actually pursuing maximization of utility? Well, in some ways they may behave as if they're maximizing utility, even if they're not consciously thinking it through. Almost certainly they're not consciously thinking it through, but that's imperfect. So it could be that what people are doing is they're developing reactions and rules of thumb to interact with life. And those rules of thumb take into account costs and benefits that they've experienced personally throughout their lives. So. There is a cost-benefit sort of framework going on, but it's not perfect maximization. And we need some nuances to build into our models that can account for the imperfection of the way people go about their lives, reacting to things, trying to pursue the best life for themselves, making their mistakes. We need, all, we need a framework for handling that. In terms of enlightened, we know that people don't have perfect information. They don't have perfect information about how much they're gonna like something moving forward. They have biases in the probabilities that they project if they take a given pathway. So we need a way of building in those biases, especially given the fact that these aren't random biases. They're biases that are fairly systematic, that can be measured in certain studies, and we can take the information from those studies and update our models according to the bad information that people use when they actually make decisions. And people are not perfect at predicting their own preferences in the future. There's all kinds of biases projecting forward. People tend to be overly optimistic. They, they focus too much on certain details compared to others. And we'd like to be able to build that into our models. And another thing here is that the choices you make could actually influence your preferences. Once you make a choice, you experience the outcome of that choice, and that's going to shift your preferences based on your new experiences, and that could iterate over time as you make choices. So classic economic modeling assumes that you have these unchanging preferences that are just inherent to your being. Behavioral economics will relax that. And finally, there's the assumption of self-interest. We know that people aren't always self-interested. They care about each other. There's such thing as altruism. Sometimes there's such a thing as spite. That can be built into models through behavioral economics. People care about equality. There's all kinds of things that are not necessarily directly self-interested that we might want to build into our models, and behavioral economics offers a bunch of tools for doing that.
that. Now, it's important to keep in mind that behavioral economics does build on classic microeconomic theory. You have to master classic microeconomic theory first before you move into behavioral economics and build those assumptions in because these are tools added on top. They're not eliminating uh, microeconomic theory. And one way of thinking about this is people aren't just completely erratic in the way they go about their lives. Now, there might be some random elements to life like mood, we can build that into a model, or um, weather, there's all kinds of things that are random that influence the way a person goes through life. But their irrationalities are predictable. So Predictably Irrational, the title of that book, really captures what behavioral economics is about. We recognize that people are irrational, but they're irrational in ways that are fairly systematic. And that means we can build models that predict the systematic errors, if they even are errors, that people make. So that's a basic overview of what we're doing in behavioral economics.